exams for all their teachers and students throughout the academic year. So most school districts have said, we can't believe this is as affordable as it is. This is so much less expensive than professional development typically is. That said, I hate charging for anything that helps students. I don't, I don't like that. So we're trying to find ways to sort of manage the expense of this. We've wondered, should we just sort of put, put 25 more cents onto the AP exam fee and subsidize this for every kid, or put 15 more cents onto the AP exam fee, or put a dollar onto the AP exam fee. We haven't quite figured out what that would need to be. And then there wouldn't be a fee for this. It would just be something every AP student and every AP teacher gets. So we're trying to figure that out, and I want your feedback on that. So let's, let's uh, pull out the clickers again. I'd like a sense, based on what you've, actually let me pause to inform your responses to these questions. I'd like a few questions about this to help you figure out what you actually feel about this. Are there questions that you have that I could respond to before you vote on the questions I have about this? Yes, sir. Yeah, at this point, we have only developed this for AP Biology, and the re one of the reasons we're presenting this here to you today is to determine whether we should build this in other AP subject areas, and if so, what the other AP subject areas should be. So I've got a question about that in a minute where I'll ask your, your point of view on that. Are there are other questions about this system that would help you uh, know how you feel about it. Yeah, sir, in the back. It's, it's, there isn't, so the, the, the provider bills us a per student cost. We don't bill schools a per student cost for this. We just have a sort of lump fee for all their teachers and students. So it's based on the size of the district. Um, I, and and uh, Leela, are you here in the room? Leela, would you stand just so, so people can see you? Leela is one of the leaders at the College Board who has developed this program. You can talk with her about how the pricing works if, if you're interested. And Leela, there's a separate session on this. Is that right? At what time? So right after this, Galileo 1005. Thanks, Leela. Okay, let's, let's vote on this. AP, what is your reaction to this statement? AP Insight is an essential next resource for improving AP performance at my school. Okay, 43% of you strongly agree, 42% of you agree, 12% of you are neutral, 1% of you disagree, 1% of you strongly disagree. Uh, you would most value the AP Insight system for which one subject area? <laughs> yeah, I deliberately did not ask all. Okay, that's not that evident. Yes, sir. Next yep, next after AP Biology. Our plans for the year actually support us developing the um, developing three ne three next subjects simultaneously. Um, but I'm curious. For your, I, I we're curious for your feedback. Okay, let's see what you said. Okay, interesting. Uh, clear, uh, clearly not AP English Literature, but um, yep. Yeah, AP English language, that's interesting, particularly given the score situation this year, right? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks for that feedback. Um, what should be the impact on the AP exam fee to make AP Insight free for all AP teachers and students? No more than 25 cents, no more than 50 cents, no more than a dollar. Do not add this into the exam fee. Keep it separate for those schools that want it. So we're trying to understand how, how much flexibility there is in the pricing of the AP exam to make this available. And of course, the more flexibility in the price of the AP exam, the more we'd be able to, um, the, the more subjects we'd be able to build, the faster we'd be able to build and so far. But at the same time, we don't like raising the AP exam fee. It's pretty high already. Okay. Okay, so 13% of you say don't raise it more than 25, 25 cents. Uh, no more than 50 cents is 14%, but 55% of you feel that we could raise the AP exam fee a dollar to subsidize this for all. 18% would prefer just to keep it separate for those schools and districts that want it. Okay, let's switch over. Let's switch over to a different topic. We've also just finished this year something we talked about last year with you. Last year we talked about piloting an AP capstone. And what this AP capstone is, is it's a two-year program that is locally designed by schools, but externally scored by the College Board and Cambridge. 
So the two-year program consists, first of all, of a seminar course in which students take a seminar. And the seminar is designed by the local teacher. And the topics that the teachers have chosen this past year are really cool. So I'm going to show you what these pilot sites have chosen as their seminar topics. So the schools do a seminar. And rather than just having an AP exam at the end of the year, students do projects throughout the year that contribute to their AP score. So that's something I really like, too. You, we can't really do that with an AP exam in AP French or AP Art History because you need a highly psychometrically reliable exam. But for something that is, that is a capstone experience, we have more flexibility for these sorts of models. So there's, in that seminar course, there are three components. There's a team project to foster teamwork. There's a presentation to foster presentation skills. And there's a written exam. And then in the second year of the program, the students do an in-depth research project, a special project that grows out of their interests and the work they've done in the seminar. So here are some of the course topics that schools taught in this pilot this year. They're pretty cool. Take a look at what these teachers have done. One teacher developed a course on child labor, one on drought and the food crisis, human trafficking, genetically modified foods, nuclear Iran, the death penalty, Childhood obesity, multiculturalism, childhood vaccination, global food disparities, the power of the nucleus, water as a finite natural resource, social media and social networks, the economic role of women. So really interesting, in-depth topics that don't really make sense to do as a standalone AP course with an AP exam, because we can't really say these are direct matches for courses that are offered at every college and university. And that's what you kind of need for a traditional AP exam. But this allows teachers with deep passion and expertise to develop a course with support and frameworks from the College Board that measure critical thinking skills and that help the teachers design these in ways that ensure the students are looking at each global problem through a multiplicity of angles and lenses and disciplines. So each of these courses is very interdisciplinary. The students are using arts, natural science, social science, mathematics, English, literature, to look at each of these problems. So that's the seminar. Here are the assessments. They're each weighted in a particular way. The team project is weighted 20%, the individual presentation 30%, and the exam is 50%. Something cool about this program is that teachers are trained on rubrics, and they first score their own students' work. And then they mail in samples of their students' work. And we validate whether or not the teacher was stringent enough too stringent or not stringent enough. So teachers are very involved, but they're held accountable to apply scoring rubrics in ways that ensure that they are scoring on standards. So I really like that also. So give us some feedback on this. My school or district would be very likely to implement this program. Okay, 28% of you agree, 30% or 28% strongly agree, 37% agree, 20% are neutral, 10% disagree, 5% strongly disagree. Um, thanks for that feedback. There's a session on the AP capstone here also at some point in the program. You'll see if, if you're interested in learning more about this, you can um, you can you can attend that session. You talked about the, your concerns about student exam performance when we talked about your priorities earlier in the session. You also indicated concerns about readiness for AP and rigor in the earlier grade levels. And, and you're right to be concerned about that, because the majority of students leave high school never ready for an AP course, which means they're probably not really ready for a college course, right? If you're not ever really ready even for AP, are you even ready for, for college? So especially five or six college courses at a time as a freshman. So this pie chart divides the high school graduating class into readiness for college level rigor. And about 30% of the students who graduated in the most recent graduating class had statistical evidence that they were ready for college level courses and 70% were. So you're right to be really concerned about this. Um, many schools are attempting pre-AP efforts. 25% of schools label courses pre-AP on their transcripts. More than 1 million students are now taking springboard coursework which can be in a very effective sort of pre-AP system because it was designed by AP teachers. And the tasks that are embedded in the Springboard program, Springboard is in math and ELA, and I'll show you some information about that in a minute, but the tasks that are embedded in it are back mapped from AP tasks. So the students are getting used to performing those sorts of tasks 
as early as sixth grade. Um, so that's, that's, that's a sign that schools are interested. There are various organizations offering pre-AP professional development, like the National Math and Science Initiative, which offers uh, terrific pre-AP professional development. So we have some questions about this whole pre-AP issue. Should the College Board audit the use of pre-AP labels on courses um, through a process similar to the AP course audit? Right now, schools kind of just choose whether or not they want to slap that pre-AP name on a course. I'm curious how you feel about that. Uh, Seventy percent of you feel that we should audit that. Thirty percent we feel sh you f feel we should not. I'd like some points of view on that, some color commentary. Could could some of you who think we should audit that? Could you tell us why you think we should do that? Yeah. Thanks. Yep, so the, 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 the comment was, for those of you who couldn't hear it, hear it, auditing would help reduce the sort of degree of subjectivity in what comprises a course that really gets kids ready for AP. It would help install some degree of consistency if a school's going to call a course pre-AP. What state are you from, by the way? Florida. Florida, okay. Do you have pre-AP courses in your school? No, it's no problem. For a reason. Um, <laughs> essentially, uh, we have pre Okay, yep, makes sense. I got it. Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, thanks in the front. The comment was by doing the AP course audit that helped districts install some consistency in AP courses across their whole district. It would be helpful to do that for pre AP courses too. Yeah, Trudy. I think it would model for the teachers what the course would look like and specify skills. In our district, I'm the overstudy studies, and you've seen it used in the ninth grade. Yes. But really, the teachers are Yeah. So the comment is it would really help teachers understand what should comprise a pre-AP course if the College Board were auditing those. Yeah, I have to tell you, the AP community was so cool about the AP audit. Like the AP audit is the largest, it is, the, it is the, by far the largest and, and maybe the only national review of curriculum. And the AP teachers are already sort of measured by the AP exam. But most AP teachers were like, you want to audit me? Fine, I'm turning in a 75-page syllabus, audit that. <laughs> it was so great. So there was a little bit of grumbling at first, but now I feel like AP teachers are just sort of there. They own, the, they own their syllabi. So that's been a great, great thing to see as the AP community has embraced that process. So thanks. John, you had a comment. Yeah, the concern was people are just slapping the label on courses to look good for parents or to sort of game the system. But if there isn't really something substantive to that pre-AP definition, that hurts all of us, right? It hurts kids. It hurts the reputation of AP. Yeah, sir. Yeah, we would, 
so we, we currently don't have the infrastructure to do the AP course audit. I don't know if you're aware of that. We use a partner to do the AP course audit. We use Epic in Oregon, which is an organization that had in place the infrastructure to do large scale syllabus review. So we do have, we would, we, we have the same question as you. If this were a priority for the college board and the AP community, we would need to do a very thorough assessment of that organization's capabilities to determine whether or not they could bring that to scale. Yep. Thanks, sir. Yep. I think the biggest problem that we see in our district is that in a pre-AP course, the teacher doesn't know the difference between a pre-AP and, and a regular biology. Pre-AP biology and regular biology, the syllabi look the same, the assessments look the same, some of the projects look the same. The teachers aren't necessarily going into the depth and getting the building blocks in place for them to be successful when they get to AP bio or AP chem. So if something like this can be put in place to train those teachers help with that process, it would be extremely beneficial. Because people don't understand the difference. Yeah. Yeah, we really agree with you. I, I feel that same same concern strongly. I'm wondering, Aditi, are you in here in the room? Is Aditi here? OK. Great. So there's a, there's a terrific leader on my staff who is leading a team effort this year to define in math, science, ELA, and history social studies a curriculum framework for grades 6 through 10. That would provide that clarity about what should be what the what the knowledge and skills are that are essential in those earlier grade levels, so that students will be ready for AP. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, thanks. That's great. Thanks a lot. Now, I'm curious to hear the counter perspective. 30% of you say the College Board should not touch this. Don't audit pre-AP courses. Leave them alone. Could I, have, could I have some rationale around that? Would one of you in the minority be brave enough to, uh, you're, I know you, you are brave. Go ahead. <laughs> this is Eileen Zimmer. The very, I would expect no less a student answer from you, Aline. So what, what her point is, if the College Board hasn't defined a pre-AP course, how can you audit it? So the definition of the pre-AP course would need to come first. Yep, great point. Other sort of perspectives on this? Yeah, thanks. Dixie. So it would take a lot of resources and there are other greater priorities. Right. Yep, thanks, sir. Yes, yeah, so this, this, this educator said that, that he had initially voted no because they can take care of this in their school through vertical teams and local design. But then after hearing the comments said, yeah, it probably could be helpful to audit, particularly if you provided sample syllabi for the teachers. And we absolutely would do that. If, if we were ever to do a pre-AP audit, we would do it in the same way as AP where we provide samples that teachers can choose from or model off of. One last comment from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is why we've always been really leery around, it. the College Board has kind of danced all around pre-AP because it is a double-edged sword. There are so many people who still believe that AP is only for 
the top 10% of the school that they then believe, well, pre-AP is only for the top 10% of the school. And the last thing the College Board has interest in is creating a program for 10% of American students. Uh, those are the sort of students that don't need another program, right? So, so we've been concerned about that and would need, so let me ask you a follow-up question on that. Um, which of the following best describes your perspective? The print is small, so listen carefully as I read your two options. Option number one, the College Board should formally offer pre-AP courses that can help schools implement the common core state standards and prepare kids for AP. So that's the first option. The College Board should offer pre-AP courses that help schools implement the common core. Option number two is the common core state standards are sufficient to prepare students for AP. The AP program does not need to concern itself with pre-AP efforts. Very interested for your response to this one. Are we all in? What, what, what do you guess? Let's see. Okay, 60 so about two thirds of you feel like the College Board should do this, and a third of you say, no, nope, leave it alone, the Common Core can take care of this. So what should, if we were to do something in pre-AP, what should be the components of any pre-AP program the College Board develops? You can choose as many of these as you like. Should it have course frameworks? Should it have teacher professional development? Should it have embedded low stakes assessments modeled on AP questions and rubrics for teachers to use? Should it have high stakes exams like AP? Should it have other components? Okay. So you say absolutely it should define the course. The, the most important thing is tell us what should be in these courses. Give us course frameworks. We are so on your page um, on that. So it should have course frameworks, it should have teacher PD, it should have embedded low stakes assessments, but not high stakes exams like AP. Or anyone, anyone care to comment on this and flesh this out for us? With a strong, anyone have a really strong perspective you want us to hear about what a pre-AP program might entail? Yeah, thanks. I'd just like to give a perspective from the international Yep. And where, where are you an international educator? Yeah. Where, are you, where do you work? In China. In China. Great. Great. So I, the, for those of you who couldn't hear the comment, the comment was the needs of a, of a sort of uh, a progression of knowledge and skills towards AP may be very different for a group of international students than students in the diversity of American high schools. And even within America, there's a diversity of high school types. So how would you really codify this? So, Yep, great point, great concern. Anything else you'd want us to hear about, about a pre-AP system? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this, this comment is, this, is flagging again this concern that by calling something pre-AP, are you creating a track? Is it, is it just create this really regimented way and that's how you get to AP? So let me ask this next question. Should the College Board call its offering pre-AP or something else? Number one, call it pre-AP. Number two, call it something else. Uh, 69% say call it pre-AP, 31% say call it something else. Do you believe a program labeled pre-AP can be appropriate for most students, yes or no? Eighty-one percent of you say yes, a pre-AP program could be uh, appropriate for most students. Nineteen percent say no, it wouldn't be. Could someone comment on the no there? Brave to be in the minority. <laughs> I think it depends on what the definition is. Okay, anyone care to comment on the no and it's fine if you don't? It's a, this could be, okay, well, good, brave. Yeah. 
so it's a recognition that, that there's very, really different levels of student ability um, coming into a school. Good. I'm sorry, this school, that might be a little bit different. Yeah, some school districts have tried to sort of say, we're going to have pre-APV universal in sixth grade, and then we will sort of need to create other routes beyond that if students don't keep up. But let's start everyone with the assumption that they're all going to college, they're all AP material. So Houston Independent School District, for example, said pre-AP is universal. We will only do pre-AP if it's the default option for every kid, and then they have to opt out of that track rather than try to opt into an AP track. So that, that's interesting. Um, does your school or district use the springboard program? Uh, a is yes and B is no. Uh, Twenty-four percent of you in the room do use it, and seventy-six percent of you do not. Uh, Pam, would you stand for a minute? I don't know how many of you know Pam Nelson is the great general manager and vice president responsible for the Springboard program, and it has been an intense year because the Springboard program has been going through a major revision to support uh, schools that are implementing the Common Core. So some really exciting things have been done, been done with Springboard. I just want you to know about quickly. The Common Core editions are um, are ready. Are 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 are. Uh, the, the work has been done and are in progress of rolling out for the 2014 copyright. So in addition to that, Springboard now has digital components so that students can access all of these materials as well as their teachers via the web. In English language arts, the Springboard team has done a terrific job of going through the texts that are recommended in the various commentaries and appendices to the Common Core. and making those available to teachers and students. So Springboard has acquired the copyrights for these um, keystone texts that are recommended within the Common Core, and they're now, they make up the backbone of the reading assignments within Springboard, so that schools and educators have immediate access to all of that Common Core uh, aligned reading content by grade level. Yeah, please. Um, does it address the shift from fiction to nonfiction? It does. Absolutely. Yep. So Springboard has met the that that is that is why a large revision has been needed because the Springboard content has shifted to align with the the sort of recommended proportions of fiction and nonfiction within the ELA sequence. Yep. And in math, there's been a sort of focus between directed activities, guided activities, investigative activities, and so on. And there's a new daily lesson format for the students. So we're excited about these changes and just want to make sure that all of those. Those of you who are involved in Springboard all know about this. I see a comment in the back of the room. Yeah, thanks. I'm having a hard time hearing that. It has to be by. Yes. Yeah, so the comment is for. Yeah. Yeah. The comment is a great one, and it is for Springboard to work, the teachers have to implement it with fidelity. The teachers need to really be committed to using these tasks. Because Springboard's very stealthy in some ways. What Springboard does is it sort of poses as a textbook, but what it really is is it's a series of tasks that are aligned with the tasks required by the Common Core assessments and the AP exams. And so it's a series of tasks, and then between those tasks, there's the content and skill development, the, the curricular material that helps teachers build those skills with their students. So for, for the Springboard program to work, the teachers need to use it, the teachers need to be bought in. And we found that professional development makes all the difference there. The Springboard community is a really passionate community of teachers that in some ways it even outshines the AP community in their passion for what they do. So that, that's exciting for us. Let's shift to another challenge that we're, that we're trying to, to, to manage. This is the challenges related to the AP exam administration. Currently, students spend valuable time on exam day gritting in their answer sheets, right? Yes. How long does that take? Yes. A while, right? Yes. And so it's not great that before a student even begins to be able to develop their knowledge, their, their fingers are a little bit sore from bubbling in all that graphite, right? This is not great. So students spend a valuable amount of time bubbling all this stuff in on exam day. So many schools, to deal with that, shift all that gritting to another day. But that's not great either because then the schools have to set up this capacity to run a day to grid in your answer sheet and a day to take the test. Schools are busy, so we don't love this about AP. Um, in addition, and here's where, where, where I really get pained, 300,000 students every year misgrid their answer sheets. <laughs> 
So we could comment on the state of the nation and, and all that sort of things. If, if even the, the, the most able students in the country aren't correctly following the instructions to grid their answer sheets. But they shouldn't really have to be worrying or thinking about that stuff. That's not what we want to measure them on. The AP exam is not a measure of a student's ability to grid personal information. So we're concerned about this. So we have a question about whether we should do something. Should we provide an online system whereby schools upload all of their students' AP registration information directly from the school's data system? The AP coordinator could then access that system and indicate whether any of the students were opting out of the exam. For the students that aren't opting out of the exam, the College Board would just pre-send material for those students that was pre-coded for those students so that no bubbling was ever required. Every, every piece of material would come with the student's identity already assigned to it. So let's get your reaction to this idea. This online bulk registration system is or is not a priority for your school, yes or no? Okay, 83% 83, 83 of you say yes, it is a priority. 17% of you say no, it's not. Could we get some comments on this one as well? Let's start with the minority perspective here. If you're in the 17% who says this really isn't a priority for us, could you tell us why? Yeah, thanks. Your school size is small. This is no big deal for you. Great. Other, yeah, thanks. The comment is, it'd be, it'd be, this is a nice to have for you, you're saying. It'd be nice to have that 20 minutes of time back, but if you had to pick this against other priorities, no. Okay, let's switch to people who do see this as a priority. Yeah, thanks, ma'am. So she's talking about an exam, the Ready Step exam, and we do bulk registration for that. We also do that in many cases for PSAT, and you're saying you would love this because you do that already and it works great for your district. Yep. Other comments? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we would do this in the fall every year so that it would be way away from the AP exam administration. And then comes to be spring and the AP coordinator just lets us know, send these exams for all the kids or here are the kids that you don't need to send an exam for. Yeah, yeah please, Nestor. So Nestor's saying at a large school like his, they spend three days managing all this gridding. They have gridding for the main exams, then gridding for the makeup exams, and then gridding for the makeup to the makeup exams. So you would like this. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Please. So the request is that there be a district capability so that this could be aggregated as a district sort of option as well as having school options. Yes, please. In the black. Okay, great, thank you. And yes, please. So this, 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 uh, the, the, this educator made the point that 
that this will help with the student errors, that even though they tell students to fill in a student ID, sometimes students put their zip code in the student ID field, and it makes for chaos when you try to match AP student data into your systems. Yep. Let's have one last comment on this. Yep, so the comment is for, dis for large districts, sometimes the district data is outdated. It contains old addresses for students. So there need to be some process to ensure that students were able to view and update those, that information if it weren't accurate, or we'd need to solve for that somehow. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep, thanks, in the back. Yeah, it's a good comment. The comment is, why don't you do it just like SAT, where it's individual student reg rather than sort of schools uploading students. We've, heard, we've asked AP coordinators about that, and what they've said is that if we took the ordering out of their hands, the, the AP programs would shrink pretty, pretty dramatically in their schools, that it's because the AP coordinator says, we're ordering exams, we're ordering these many exams for this many students, that those exams actually get ordered. And we actually have seen that. When we've tried to motivate AP students to sort of do things online, we get very low rates at which AP students respond and actually do that. Kids are busy. But you're right, we need some system to allow for students that would fall outside of school databases, like homeschooled students, or students that are not taking a course but want to opt into the exam. Please, continue. Yeah, so we'd like to, this, this educator's had an experience doing SAT school day, so we'd like to speak with you. I'm going to have someone stand up here. Mark Cavone and Terry Redican, could you stand up? So these are the two leaders within the College Board who are thinking about this project, and so if you could connect with them, I think they'd really appreciate your feedback. Okay, a last comment on this. Yep. So this is an educator who says, they, <laughs> I'm looking at the head of AP Canada right here. George Iwanis, will you stand up? George is the head of AP in Canada and has done an amazing job expanding and, and, and supporting AP in Canada. AP is incredible. I don't know if you know this. AP is incredibly strong in Canada. And the universities in Canada love AP and give scholarships to AP students. I mean, it's really, really healthy. And a lot of it's because of this great man's work. But the, the, the situation this, this educator described is that their school is in America. But it's close to the Canadian border, and because there aren't some AP schools in that part of Vancouver, a bunch of kids cross the border to take AP exams. There needs to be something to support the border hoppers. Okay, good. We'll take that into account. Okay, let me ask you now some tough questions. The College Board, we, the, the way we work, we're a nonprofit organization, as you know, and so the AP exams generate, the AP exam fees come in. And we first of all use those AP exam fees to cover the costs of AP, to pay for mostly the AP scoring. The largest expense of AP is the bringing together of college faculty and high school teachers to score the AP exams. So once we've paid to score the AP exams, and we've paid to develop and print and ship the exams and report the exams and so on, paid our electricity bills, all of that stuff, any surplus because we're a nonprofit, we're required to invest back in to the programs and services that are part of our mission of expanding access to college success. So, we, whenever AP generates surplus, and for most of AP's history, it didn't. The program was so expensive to operate that for most years, it was operated at a loss and subsidized by other work the College Board did. But now the AP program is large enough that it does generate surplus, and so we have resources to do these sorts of things, these sorts of projects. But there is probably more here that we've described than we have the finances and the staff to do successfully. So I'm gonna ask you to help us prioritize these projects we've talked about. So indicate each of the following that you think it is essential for the AP program to pursue. One is 
You think it's essential that we pursue new AP courses like those that we talked about. Number two, you think it's essential that we pursue AP Insight and other subjects. Number three, you think it's essential that we roll out the AP Cambridge Capstone program. Number four, you think it's essential that we do pre-AP work. And number five, you think it's essential that we do bulk online registration of AP students. So vote for each of those that you think is essential. Okay, so the most essential according to you, 29% of you all feel that AP Insight is essential. Next is number four, pre-AP, then bulk online registration for students, then the AP Cambridge Capstone, and then new AP courses. Now I'm gonna ask you to pick just one. So there are College Board staff all around the room very eager to see which of their projects you most like. <laughs> So if there are one pro you can vote if there are only one thing the college board we're going to focus on doing really well this year, which would you have us do? Pick your top priority for the AP program to pursue. Pick only one. Number one, new AP courses. Number two, AP Insight and other subjects. Number three, the AP Cambridge Capstone. Number four, pre-AP. And number five, bulk online registration of students. Okay. Super excited for this. Let's see what people say. Okay. So 48% of you say if we only do one thing, it should be to expand AP Insight and other subjects. And the second largest is 22% of you feel it should be pre-AP. And the third is bulk online registration for students. So helpful, helpful feedback. We appreciate this opportunity to hear your perspectives, to have dialogue with you. Let me... Um, let me, introduce someone. Let me introduce someone quickly. In the back of the room, uh, someone is here who helps us make these decisions at the College Board, who helps us think through our priorities, who helps us sort of figure out how we're going to allocate resources. So let me just have uh, at the back of the room our Chief Operating Officer, Jeremy Singer, sort of signal. It's Jeremy. So I, I, uh, I can say on his behalf, I'm sure he appreciates the chance to have sort of heard your feedback here today as well. Thank you for that. Let me take just the last couple of minutes to answer any questions you have that we haven't focused on in this presentation. For, so, so open Q&A that you have. Yeah, please. So it's a comment, but not a question. Great. So the comment is, for those who couldn't hear it, that there's a hope that the College Board will take seriously the need to create and support pre-AP courses because many states like Texas don't have the Common Core, or some states like Texas don't have the Common Core and, and really need an articulation of what should be in the courses prior to AP. Thanks for that comment. Other, other comments or Q&A? Yep, please. Great, so the feedback is more online professional development because budget cuts and other challenges have made it difficult to send all teachers to face-to-face -face professional development. Great, thanks for that feedback. Other comments or questions? Yep, thanks, ma'am. Yeah, so I, I got, that's the point of question. The question is, when you, do, when you survey people like this, do you ever disaggregate it by teachers versus administrators? Absolutely. I, I guess I'd want to make clear, this is not, 
this is not how we make decisions at the College Board, <laughs> right? I can take this back and say, okay, this is, what we're, this is what the AP community wants. We use a much more scientific process of really understanding segments that are nationally representative and in cases where it's important, internationally representative. So we do thorough segmentation analysis and then we sort of stack that up against internal capability analysis and so on. Yeah, thanks. Yes, please. Okay, so the next, the question is, what are the next AP subjects that are going through the AP redesign? So already announced are those that start this, this coming fall. So the redesigned chemistry and Spanish language courses begin this fall. Also already announced, because we announced two years before they take effect, to ensure that teachers have time to go to professional development, to work with each other, to redesign their syllabi. So also announced is for fall 2014, the redesigned AP US history, and Physics B has been changed into two new physics courses, AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2. So we will announce this fall, fall 2013, the redesigned subjects that will take effect in fall 2015, because we always announce two years in advance. But, but the ones that we are working on for that announcement are European history and art history. Yep, please. No, I'll. Yep. Yes, yes, we anticipate. Yep. Yep. Thanks. It's 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 a, it's uh, the site the the qual the the psychometric quality of the multiple choice sections is better with the four response items. So, yeah. Thanks. When we are say, yeah, yeah. This the part of the request for the College Board to do something about the current uses of pre-AP on students' transcripts comes from the college, college, the higher ed community. The admissions officers are saying we're seeing a proliferation of courses labeled pre-AP on high school and middle school transcripts. What does that even mean? What are those college board? And it's kind of embarrassing for us, right? Like, well, we don't really know. We own that trademark, but we don't really know what those courses are. So we will, the, there will be, uh, high reds involvement will be key to that, those sorts of conversations. Others, yes? Yeah, so is the college board looking at all for, to, to move towards online assessment in the future? So two of the AP exams are solely online assessments. AP Chinese and Japanese can only be taken online because part of the construct, part of what those exams has to measure is the student's ability to write in Japanese and Chinese. And the, the higher ed community felt it was more important that they be able to type and use computers to write in Chinese and Japanese than to write by hand in, in the 21st century. So the computer has always been essential to the measurement of Chinese and Japanese. It's been that way since the start of those exams. The new AP Computer Science Principal exam will be all, will be all digital as well. Studio Art has half, about, about two thirds of the Studio Art exam is a digital submission, a digital portfolio. We are very interested in moving other exams um, into a digital modality. I care especially about the AP English exam being a digital exam because increasingly the, the, sort, the, the writing skills that students learn involve writing on a keyboard that allows for revision and shaping capabilities that are very different from what a student does when they're writing out longhand. So I worry increasingly that, the, that an exam that measures writing skills through handwritten work is not a valid assessment and does not give students the best opportunity to write the way they typically learn and, and act when they write. So we're concerned about that. What the big constraint that we've faced is we haven't seen school capabilities sufficient to scale synchronous high stakes assessment at, at the security levels required by AP and, and by other high stakes assessment. So we're, that, that there should be a tipping point we would imagine soon. We're trying to figure this out. If we, would, if, if we could ever sort of shift AP to a through course assessment model where the exams weren't three hours, but could fit into an individual class period that could book a computer room for that assessment on that day, maybe there's something workable there. But it's been a challenge and we haven't figured that out yet, but we're very interested in moving in that direction. 
Other comments or questions? Any feedback on that? Actually, I'm, I'm curious what your sense of that is. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there would need to be a window period rather than an exam date given school capabilities. That's right. Let me just see by show of hands, how many of you would feel you would want AP exams online right away if we had them online? How many of you feel like we are ready as a school? And how many of you feel like if all the AP exams were online, we wouldn't be able to give them? Yeah, okay. Hey, we are out of time. It has been so great to be here with you. Thank you so much for your feedback.